improve economic security for displaced Venezuelan populations in Ecuador. And then simultaneously, Drs. Kerry Keyes and Ajmal Sabawun received an award in this competition for their project to understand migration experiences, estimate mental health burden, and assess service use among Afghans resettling in the United States. So congratulations to both groups. And, and I think on behalf of the skill, we are thrilled with the leadership already coming from the Global Mental Health Program, led by Dr. Sikama. Um, and these two projects are key forerunners of much more to come. Really excited to add another layer of welcome, which is to all of you to the launch of our Global Mental Health Program at Columbia's Mailman School of Public Health. We know that this work will bring together faculty, staff, and student leaders across disciplines and departments to generate the evidence we need for innovative public health approaches to promoting mental health, creating population resilience in the face of stressors, translating science into impactful population-based strategies and policies, and building the future leadership for our field. Now, some people say, well, why population health? We already do clinical care. Um, and I think Dr. Sikama and I have been deeply in accord on the profound need we have for much stronger, much more um, effective and much more enhanced leadership by the public health community. while lowering both the um, incidence and prevalence as well as the stigma of mental illness and mental distress. To do this requires that we work to prevent mental disorders across the lifespan to prevent them and to create the conditions that create the buffers we all need to not arrive at the levels of distress that I think we are seeing nationally and globally right now. And to prevent these mental disorders across the lifespan and the too often really consequential comorbid health conditions and threats to well being. We need multi level population based interventions, which increase resiliency and diminish risk of mental ill health. We need them to be tailored to the communities at risk. We need them to include support for access to treatment of both those with mental disorders and those with subclinical distress. And we need everyone's participation and collaboration in this. To do all of this requires that we be guided by the principle of health equity as the foundation for the goals and that we address the disparities created by the social determinants of mental health and mental ill health including um, racism, ethnicity, gender, social conditions such as poverty, structural inequities, discrimination, and stigma. All of this is, we are clear, is public health responsibility and also public health opportunity. So I am thrilled to finish this welcome of so many layers of, of important initiatives and work being celebrated starting today and to reiterate and reaffirm our commitment, our deep commitment in this Public Health Equity Week to public health responsibility, to creating health equity in our world. I look forward to learning with you much more about the activities, plans and goals for global mental health at Mailman and as we grow this longstanding area of excellence at Columbia University into a whole new generation of work. And I'll, it's my honor now to turn this over to Dr. Sikama. Thank you. It's always reassuring to know we're on the same page. <laughs> so thank you, Dean Fried. I know you're triply booked today, so we appreciate you coming. Um, I just wanna say those of you on tables, you're, you're 
fine to be on tables, but if you'd like to sit, there are some chairs and hopefully everyone is comfortable. I think we've also learned that it's difficult. We're having a little IT problem to see the PowerPoint and to see the speaker, correct, Amelia? So um, hopefully what that means is that you all can see us, but the people that there's a few people on Zoom that couldn't make it today. So hopefully they can hear us and see the slides. And once, once we progress without slides, then we'll be able to see them. So let me proceed at this point then. Um, I can actually see who's on the Zoom, but you can't. So um, I first wanna say, uh, first of all, thanks. Thank you to Dean Freed and to the school for doing Public Health Equity Week and that we are um, really honored to be the first event in that and that's uh, the series of things going on this week. Um, I also want to, before I um, proceed with other discussion, is, is really thank the planning committee for this event. You will hear from all of them um, throughout the course of what we're going to do today. Um, Kate Lavero, Claire Green, Jeremy <coughs> Kane, Ezra Susser, and none of this would have happened without Amelia Murthy um, running everything from the side, my coordinator. So thanks, thanks for that. Um, as, sorry, one second. As Dean Fried noted, this is also Indigenous Peoples Day. Um, uh, so we are honoring the past, present, and future of the Native peoples throughout the United States. I think it's really important to note what we recognize in this holiday, because it's also very relevant to the field of global mental health. The holiday recognizes the legacy and impact of colonialism on Native communities, and it also celebrates cultures, contributions, and the resilience of contemporary Native people. So I wanted to acknowledge that and have us that in our mindset as well as we proceed. Okay, so um, did the slide move? Yes, okay. This was basically the same slide, uh, noting that I'm speaking. Sorry about that. <laughs> Okay, so today is World Mental Health Day, which was why we had planned to do the event on this day. Um, so we have a lot of things going on today in this school and we're pleased that we can put um, focus on mental health. Um, I will only briefly say a couple of statistics because I imagine you are all in the room because you know that we must address the mental health and mental health conditions locally and globally. Um, for example, in case you don't know a couple of statistics, one, of four of, one out of four of us will have a mental illness in our lifetime. One out of five young people between the ages of seven and 18 will have some type of mental health condition that affects their functioning in, on a daily basis. Um, if you think about the number of people that need mental health treatment, five to 10% of them around the globe actually access that and only 25% in higher resource settings. So I, I'm not, we know that we've had increases in depression and suicide, especially after COVID that impacted all of us, but some populations in particular. I'd like to think of what, what have we learned from COVID and maybe, maybe one benefit is that we're talking about mental health a lot more. <laughs> and so I, I see that as a norm. I'm a, I'm, I think that norm change is a very important way to influence and to change. And so the more we talk about it, the more we destigmatize um, mental health conditions, as well as focus on uh, overall well being, which is the focus for today. Um, Dean Fried alluded to, and we'll talk more about the growing inequalities, issues of stigma and discrimination, climate change, related displacements. There are so many issues in our world that, that affect mental health. And we'll come to this when we talk about research future, how we do study designs from an interdisciplinary perspective. So I'm not going to belabor those points, but to acknowledge um, how many issues affect mental health. So briefly, um, uh, the working group put together um, vision, mission, and goal statements. And so our overall vision, it's important to note how interdisciplinary we hope our group will continue to grow and expand to lead in mental health research, programs, intervention development, and educational initiatives. If you just do me a favor, how many of you are students? The great majority. I'm still a student. We're all still students, but technically you are students in Malman. There's great interest by students and we're very excited to, um, to bring you in and to develop, pro to develop educational programs further while we're collaborating around Columbia and around the globe. So uh, 
as noted in our welcome by the Dean, we want to contribute, we want public health to have a prominent role in understanding the determinants and developing and um, implementing interventions that address both treatment and access to treatment, as well as prevention. And then lastly, the objectives cut across what we feel our primary focus, uh, which includes the inter, when I say interdisciplinary, many of us um, may be trained in different disciplines. That's the beauty of a public health school. And so part of why we want this to be a school-wide effort is to be able to address and, and really build and maximize what we know from each other's disciplines, methods, have that be reflected in training and the education that we offer. And really importantly, to develop equitable and sustainable partnerships. Um, most of us that have been doing this for decades or one year or one month know how essential it is to have true partnerships um, and to be able to potentially grow them together. So let me say, speaking of partnerships, that if you haven't seen this page, it's important that you do. Um, our, the, there are many people around Columbia that work in global mental health. And so this is the primary website of the global mental health programs. So most of our projects across Columbia, this is coordinated by the Department of Psychiatry. This is a place to find out some of the things that we're doing. Um, and some of the faculty are in the room or online, but we, want, we wanted you to know about that resource. Uh, yes, we have, I see Milton Weinberg and Myrna Weissman. There's a couple of our uh, faculty from psychi psychiatry who are on, on the Zoom right now. Let me point out to what we're, um, one thing that has recently happened, I believe the population mental health certificate is two years old, maybe three, maybe some of you are, are doing that certificate, but we're pleased to have a formal population mental health certificate led by Dr. Carrie Keyes in EPI, who happens to be at the World Psychiatric Association meeting in Morocco. <laughs> so she wishes she was here, but maybe we wish we were in Morocco, but she is at the EPI and uh, public health section of the World Psychiatric Association as is Melissa Dupont-Reyes, who's a new recruit to SMS, who is also at the conference. So there, we had difficulty in picking days. So I want, I want to just take a moment, um, sorry, don't have my clock on the computer. I want to just take a moment to hit some key points here um, so that you, you have a sense of what's happened in the last 20 years in global mental health. Um, Really just over 20 years ago was when w the WHO World Health Report finally focused on mental health. People have been doing mental health research around the globe for a long time, but it was only 20 years ago where it was actually formally mentioned. Um, then you see in 2007 was the first Lancet series on global mental health, which in many ways was what started the movement <laughs> um, and maybe defined us as a field and gave us an identity across the work that people were doing and wanted to do. A number of other things happened over time related to um, the WHO um, GAP action program to start getting evidence-based interventions more into the field. The Grand Challenges um, was also put out in the second Lancet series led by our um, colleague and, and friend of many, Pamela Collins, who had spent time here at Columbia. And then it was a major um, uh, accomplishment when the UN uh, Sustainable Development Goals actually included mental health for the first time. Mental health was not mentioned in the Millennium Goals, but was in the SDGs. And I will talk briefly about how much that has begun to advance the field. And this is a very key, I'll come back to this, 2018 Lancet Commission on Global Mental Health, which is where it was acknowledged that we must focus on the treatment gap, as, as was noted, but that we also need to move to health promotion and resiliency and to diversify our disciplines with an emphasis on human rights. And so that's, that's a quick, quick overview of the last 20 years and how we are now at today, which is um, uh, World Mental Health Day with the theme of making mental health and well-being for all a global priority, as well as a sorry, as well as a report that just came out about transforming mental health for all by the um, also by the WHO. All right, so this is just to make the point that I think has been made well, which is as we move into mental health promotion and universal prevention, we focus. Yes, we still continue to focus on individual factors to build resiliency and coping and access treatment for mental health issues, but we really want to also focus on social capital and structural changes. And I'll say a little bit more about that in a second. 
This probably looks familiar to everyone. The social determinants of health, Bob probably teaches this every other day in some way or another. Many of you maybe have been in classes, obviously in the school that reflect this. The, the reason for noting these five domains is if you said to me, I'm interested in gun violence, or I'm interested in migration, or I'm interested in mental health, we would think about these um, social determinants. So what we want to do is advance the area of mental health, global and population mental health along these lines. And I won't go into detail on this, but if you would like to learn much more about the, the going the direction of social determinants and mental health, the 2018 paper by Crick Lund um, in Lancet was a review of reviews to be able to look at the social determinants. I know it's very complicated, but um, I can get you the citation where the five domains are down the left here social, environmental, neighborhood, economic, and demographic mapped onto the SDGs. And if you look in there, you see things like education, climate, clean water. These are, these are the social determinants of health that actually also apply to mental health and why we're talking about food insecurity, um, migration, the different, different factors on a, on a societal level that are influencing mental health. And then what's along here are various distal and proximal factors like um, employment, I mentioned food security, trauma and violence, which is my area of research. And this, se this sequence here means that we must do this across the lifespan from infancy, possibly during pregnancy <laughs> to older age. And so this is a very good model for thinking about how, what, how we might target different social determinants. And this is a little bit easier visual for presenting them, which is uh, the pic, this is also courtesy of Crick Lund. These are photographs, many of them from um, the areas in South Africa where my own work is on HIV and sexual trauma. And that even if we are doing interventions that may be clinically based or individual based, that we must take into consideration the various um, social factors that people, where they're living. And what we want to do is think about how do we actually do research on those types of interventions. We've known for over a decade that poverty alleviation and mental health are highly associated in every study that you look at. And so, but we're only beginning to do interventions on poverty alleviation, looking at mental health as an outcome. <clears throat> So if you think about prevention and health promotion, what, what we will talk about today is how we can address these types of issues and look at mental health outcomes in doing so. Um, so this is, this is a, develop, it's a sustainable development report for good health and well-being, which is the SDG that mental health is under. And just so that you know, we have a long ways to go. <laughs> um, none of the... Um, None of our countries are in green, which means that SDGs have been achieved. Almost all of them are significant challenges and major challenges. And so we have a long road ahead of us, <laughs> um, but we certainly um, have targets and really need to think differently. These are some thoughts that I'll put out there, which will be picked up by the panel and Dr. Susser will speak in a moment, that these are, are points that I would make as future priorities for consideration that we rethink social determinants of global mental health, rethinking meaning, where should we do this work? How do we do more work in churches, in schools? Um, how do we address these types of social and structural influences in a way that can have a population impact? Um, what might those interventions be focused on? I'd mentioned um, uh, my work and work of others in chronic stress and complex trauma. Um, if you if you fix if I if I increase HIV medication adherence and, they, and suppress viral load, which is what my research in HIV is about, but I do it through a mental health intervention. What other benefits are there in terms of mental health? How can clinics change to integrate mental health provide mental health treatment provided by non specialists? Many of you in this field know that we've been. We've been working on task shifting and now we call it task sharing, but the notion of how to get interventions, evidence-based interventions to, to individuals. But now we want to be able to think about how we address racism. Our interventions, are, do we do, can we do interventions with the police that address racism in a way that actually enhances mental health? 
and builds resilience or prevents disorders or, or provides opportunities for treatment. So these are some of the ways we want to be thinking and we'll hear much more about migration and humanitarian responses. Um, this is why we need innovative interdisciplinary approaches. These are complicated study designs. <laughs> Uh, what have we done? Have we done enough research so we're ready for implementation science? Um, and very importantly, what can we look at the pathways to examine causal mechanisms? If, if something works, we need to understand why, especially if we're doing something that has multiple outcomes um, by doing a structural intervention. So those are my comments for um, thinking forward on this. And this is, uh, let me tell you how the rest of the morning will go. Dr. Susser's gonna make a few comments, and then we're gonna have a panel of um, uh, new, uh, faculty that have come to um, Malman in the last few years who are our global mental health is their area of focus be joined by Dr. Fullalove from a community local perspective and um, Ale, a doctoral student. So that will do a lot of, they'll discuss and we'll have questions at that time. So I just wanted to say that um, I meant to show you this slide as I was saying their names. <laughs> so I will come, come back to this, um, but this is um, what, what the rest of today will be. And then hopefully people will be able to stay around for networking after and lunch. So I just wanted to give you an overview of the day. All right, so I'm going to turn this over. Dr. Susser is, we're gonna see if this is gonna work. Um, and Dr. S Dr. Ezra Susser from the Department of Epidemiology is going to um, make a few comments about a few other topics. So Ezra, you want to, oops, okay. It says that I can't start screen sharing. Oh, now I can, okay. And I wanna just add a couple of complementary themes related to social justice and injustice in global mental health. And um, the key point is that a key index of a humanistic society is, I think, the condition of the very most disadvantaged. And who are they? Well, there are several groups, but they almost always include people with severe mental illness, because in most societies, those are among the people whose lives are the least valued. Can you move on? Or can I do it? Oh, I can do it, okay. So I want to also note the importance of intersectional disadvantage. That's people with mental illness plus other, rhyme, other reasons for their lives being less valued. For example, you know, plus being poor and black, in the United States. They're the most likely to be extremely disadvantaged, also comorbid physical conditions and so forth. And they present the greatest challenge, but they're especially important from a justice point of view. So what can we do? Well, as Kathy emphasized, it's essential to address structural social determinants to, to make a difference for people in this condition, housing, employment, reducing discrimination. You need those to mitigate the extreme disadvantage and to facilitate social inclusion, which is one of the essential components. And it's also essential to address people's mental illness um, in this group. And in addition to standard approaches, you know, which are well known, um, I want to mention that a recovery orientation is very important. Without going into details, that's an approach that injects hope and enhances autonomy for people that have these conditions. And who can do it? Well, there's many stakeholders involved, but the most essential and also the most often left out are the people with the illness themselves and their families. Now they, in my view, they always need to be central to the design, the implementation and so forth. And it has to be locally inspired and implemented. From high income countries, we can contribute ideas, models and more than that. But we can impose a specific approach. What we do has to be well, what's done has to be culturally congruent with the locale 
and needs to be compatible with local resources. And that, that I think it's essential to keep that in mind. The other aspect of social justice here is what we can, what's now quite a current topic in global mental health, which is decoloniality. So what does that mean? Well, it always includes a shifting of the balance of power from the wealthy donor countries to low and middle income countries. Beyond that, you know, this is all disputed and debated, you know, but it always begins with the recognition of this power imbalance and the need to address it. And, you know, because of time limits, I just give you for quick reference, think of religious missionaries in the 19th century, the kind of things they did, sometimes with the best of intentions, but which promoted colonialism. And think of the nation building euphemism, which you all know about from today's world, but is a strategy that's been used since the colonial era and still is being used. So the theme of decoloniality, if you put it in very simple terms, is to move as far away from those as possible. And a book has come out, um, which I've, if you want to learn more about this, um, at the bottom, Reimagining Psychiatric Epidemiology in a Global Frame. So I'm gonna give just a couple of examples from um, the School of Public Health here. Um, there are local projects here led by students and early investigators going on in many regions of the globe. And one example is in Guatemala, which pertains to the points that I discussed with people with severe mental illness. So that would be one example. We also have global projects that are driven by students and early investigators. And one example of those is a study on healthcare workers in COVID called the HERO study. And that pertains to decoloniality. There are so many relevant faculty led projects. So I don't have the time here to discuss them, um, but we could in the discussion period. So here's the first one in Guatemala. It's led by um, Dr. Alejandra Aniego Avila, who I refer to as Ale, as many people do. And this is funded by a Global Mental Health Council pilot grant, which um, is from the GMHP, um, led by Kathy Pike at um, New York State Psychiatric Institute. Kathy also is an important member of the Department of Epidemiology, where she makes a lot of contributions too. So in case you don't remember where Guatemala is, um, on the bottom left for me is just shows you that. And then there's a picture of the particular, um, a, a broad picture of the particular region where Ali's working, which is Solala, which I hope you can see it. It's in, it's in larger letters. And it's near, it's around Lake Atitlan, which um, many of you might be familiar with if you've ever been to Guatemala. This is Indigenous Peoples Week, and this project is focused on Indigenous people in Guatemala. And these pictures um, give you, well, one is of the scenic view there, and the others are of the people um, in the region of Solala. And the, in this region, there are um, 22 different languages, many versions of Quechua, and not everybody speaks Spanish. They're also um, a population that were really traumatized by the civil war in Guatemala and are themselves, in a sense, a subjugated population within Guatemala. So what she's doing is um, beginning by the, the, the Guatemala has ver, almost no mental health services still. And it has one large psychiatric hospital 
which is um, has been named the worst psychiatric hospital in the world because of um, the abuse and indignities there. So she's trying to start by understanding what is what the perspectives of all the different people in the community are there so that she can develop a recovery, a recovery oriented program for people with severe mental illness in, in that area. The second example is um, another study led by students and early investigators. Franco Maschiano plays maybe the most leading role in this, but, but many others do too among our students and early investigators and others from other parts of the world. And this just gives you a picture of the different studies um, that of the different countries that have been involved in this initiative. And um, in this initiative, because um, it's really driven by the younger generation or, you, or younger than me anyway. And um, there's been a lot of discussion about decoloniality. You know, what does that mean? And you see a reference there from Lancet Psychiatry where we tried to um, discuss how that's, the, the, how that's evolved you know, in, in this project, which is actually um, has its base, its database in Latin America not in the um, global north. And we really try to, um, to develop an equitable um, way of working with each other in this project. I'll just say very briefly, as Kathy said, the early origins before the global mental health movement, which were the seeds, of, that later came together as the global mental health movement. A couple of things that I was involved in, um, one is in Neyken, Argentina, in the Patagonia region, Jose Luhrmann um, built there a community-based mental health team led by primary care doctors. So there were teams where primary care doctors were the leaders and involved a lot of task sharing. And he sustained that since 1990, it's still going. So I, I think that's very important. If you can keep a program going for more than 30 years, um, that's something. And this was also the seed of um, the Ready Americas Network in Latin America, which we later built. And um, from which the two projects I mentioned are in a sense offshoots. So, you know, I'm still working with them closely, but, you know, that, but he leads this, and, you know, everything is, is done there and determined there. The other example is in KwaZulu-Natal, South Africa. It just the pictures are just to remind you where South Africa is. You can see Durban and KwaZulu-Natal in the lower one is in red. It's Durban is in it. And here we were building on the HIV AIDS program that's led by um, Slim and Koresha Kareem, who you probably all know by now. And my parents and me and them, um, this was the first um, of the Fogarty program, of the international programs, which was successfully um, handed over to um, the South African investigators to lead. That, that wasn't actually allowed in, at the time we were beginning this. And you know, over a long period, um, building on their work, we began work in mental health in the 1990s. And that involved engaging with traditional healers in a region of a poor, very poor region of KwaZulu Natal, where, for those of you who don't know, this, you know, it, uh, it's the epicenter of HIV. It 
has 50% unemployment, you know, and, and so forth. It's a very poor area. It's just a picture of the local traditional healers. And um, I don't think I have time to say much about this, but um, the picture of giving a sheep to a local chief is just one of the things that, that we did to be in conformity with local customs because there's an informal parallel government there and the traditional healers primarily report to the tribal chiefs. Now, some of the people who are now, probably all of you may know them in global mental health, like Pamela Collins, um, Graham Thornacraft, who developed the mental health gap. Um, their first experience was actually in these two places. And well, Pamela's not the first, but the first lung experience. And um, so strangely enough, you know, these small initiatives can, um, can have flowering consequences um, later on and, and new leaders can come out of them. Um, okay, so last point. Um, the global mental health is also local, and sometimes um, we refer to this as the fourth world. You know, in, in New York City, for example, right here, we have more mental, more people with mental illness in prisons than we do in hospitals, and they are neglected, untreated. They're often severely punished for um, symptoms, which are seen as punishable infractions, sometimes put in solitary confinement for two weeks or longer because of their symptoms. And we have people with mental illness who are homeless. And um, the two pictures of people on the streets. The other is I put up because it's from across the road from the armory where we have our graduation ceremonies and so forth. But in the 80s and 90s, the armory was um, a place with 1,000 men in cots, as you see, homeless men in cots, which um, it kind of looks like Dante's Inferno, um, but there's a lot of collective and interesting life within it. But it's also a source of, um, for obvious reasons, it was a source of multi-drug resistant TB, and other infectious diseases, which brings me to COVID. So in the COVID-19 pandemic, the, um, the presence of shell congregate shelters with no chance to socially distance or, um, or to do any of the other things really that are required for protection from COVID and to stop transmission. Um, in, in the beginning, with that emergency, we suddenly found, um, the city suddenly found the resources to move within two months, half of the single homeless men from congregate shelters to vacant hotels. And these hotels, you know, are, have been shown to be much safer, improved quality of life for um, reasons that may be obvious, but I don't have time to explain. But what it showed is that although homelessness has increased from you know, five times since we started working on this in the 1980s, which we never thought, we couldn't imagine would have happened. It, and that's because of social determinants, low income housing, et cetera. But it's just become to seem like a intractable problem. People become complacent about it. But here was the clear demonstration that it's not intractable, that there, there are solutions that can be implemented even in short periods of time. So we built a group called Hotels New York City. It's a research and advocacy group, works alongside um, advocates for homeless people, the homeless hero is one, and the coalition for the homeless. 
but for reasons that have never been revealed, and I certainly don't understand, Mayor de Blasio decided to evict the people who'd been moved into these um, better conditions back to the shelters or to wherever they went, which ended up doing more harm. So the initiative ended up doing more harm than good because people were dislocated twice and then sent back to places where they couldn't protect themselves. City collects no data about um, even how many homeless people are, there are, but never mind. They don't collect any data about vaccination, COVID death rates, COVID infection rates, and so forth. And that's also part of our um, part of our goal, which we are um, trying to help the pandemic research initiative here um, to address that. Um, so I think that's. Uh, that's it for me, and um, on to um, the next speakers who are gonna be the future leaders. Thanks. David. So if I can call our panel forward, move to the next activity. Okay, thanks. All right, um, thank you, Ezra. And hopefully the, um, those comments provided a background on the history of global mental health and um, our thoughts towards the future to focus uh, to expand our focus, uh, continue to focus on the treatment gap as well as um, moving forward to the um, prevention, promotion, and social determinants. So um, I think I've introduced this group in various ways. Jeremy Kane needed to be on Zoom today. He's up on the screen <laughs> in the middle, I think, of the others. Um, and so hopefully everyone can see the majority of people there. Okay. Um, so many of you know uh, Dr. Bob, especially the students probably know him as Dr. Bob. Robert Fullalove, we're pleased to have here for a um, sort of our community local, how we can address mental health perspective, Claire Green um, and Kate Lavero, who were both also introduced by the Dean as, as well as Jeremy as, as one of the um, recipients of the Grand Challenges Awards. And this is Ale, the, the very uh, very, very well known doctoral student that Ezra just spoke about. So I'm going to turn it over to them. They have a plan for um, making comments, discussing with each other, and then we will be sure um, if there's a really pressing thing to ask, just jump up and say you can't wait. <laughs> but we will leave 10, 15 minutes at the end for questions. All right. Good. There's one. Um, thanks, Kathy. Is that very loud? So um, I'm just going to kick us off today with a little summary. As mentioned, my name is Kate Lavero, but my name tag keeps falling off, so I'm just going to leave it. Um, I think as, as Kathy and Ezra really um, well summarized earlier and, and dove into a little bit, you know, global mental health as a field has changed a lot in the last 20 years. And so I first just want to highlight some of those points before we jump in with the other panelists to kind of talk a little bit more about that. And as Kathy said, you know, we definitely welcome your questions or comments as we go along. Certainly we don't think of ourselves as the only opinions and perspectives on the state of the field right now. So I think the two big um, thoughts we had going into this panel of sort of where mental, global mental health is and what's changed. I think the first thing is really what the definition is of mental health. And it's really shifted from an illness perspective to more of a well-being perspective in recent years. Um, and this has really opened some doors for research and uh, implementation of interventions around prevention, promotion, early intervention. But at the same time, what Ezra has sort of touched on has left a lot of people um, out of the limelight, particularly those uh, with severe mental illness who need um, more intensive treatments than might be uh, given in these universal promotion type approaches. And then I think on the other hand, what we really have um, is this shift again from having a siloed perspective of mental health and mental illness to mental health in the context, right? And so part of that is thinking about mental health and its relationship to physical health. And I think um, Kathy's highlight of the um, inclusion of mental health in the sustainable development goals seven years ago really puts into perspective the idea that people started noticing how integrated mental health was to physical well being. And so I think, at least in my perspective, it hits home for me because I did not train in mental health or global mental health. Um, I actually came to this work, um, particularly adolescent mental health services, 
working in HIV and tuberculosis treatment in pediatric populations and realizing how much work we were putting into for testing and treating these patients and, and not really attending to their psychosocial needs at the same time. Um, and then I think the other side of sort of de-siloing mental health um, is thinking about mental health in the social determinants context, as Kathy also pointed out, right? So one, um, thinking about when we're creating interventions that they can in fact be implemented in the context um, where we want them to be, depending on the resources, the gender dynamics, the history, the culture, all of these things we need to consider when we're trying to expand access to care. And then the other side too is thinking about, can we address in parallel um, these social determinants of mental health along with mental health interventions? And I think Claire will talk a little about this more um, with our Centennial Award, bringing in economic inclusion uh, to mental health services tied together. So I think all that is to say, really, we have some big challenges ahead of us. So we're excited um, as a school of public health to be able to think about this in a really diverse way across departments and also in collaboration with the other global mental health programs across schools at Columbia. And I think also very important to highlight um, with students who I think have um, the better ideas probably than we do. And also um, with our collaborators around the world, I think we don't wanna, again, pretend that we in this academic world have all of the answers. So really growing collaborations with that. So at that, I think I'll kick it off to Claire to talk a little bit about our different disciplines. Perfect. Thank you, Kate. Um, and again, it's really a pleasure to be here with all of you today. So I wanted to talk a little bit about what Kate was alluding to around this kind of evolving landscape of global mental health. And I think some of the history and the context that Kathy and Ezra provided really highlighted some of the advancements that have been made. That's something I often think about from the public health lens is I think we have done a lot to learn about how to address mental health for individuals. We have advanced a lot on understanding individual risk factors and protective factors for mental health. We've learned a lot about what interventions work or don't work for certain populations, certain people. But I think the thing that I find myself struggling with and thinking about a lot is then why aren't we seeing an impact on the population level, given all of the investments in global mental health um, that have been made over the past couple of decades, ever since some of those milestones that Kathy shared with you. And I think there are probably a lot of explanations for this, um, but the one that I keep coming back to is the need for kind of more interdisciplinary, inclusive collaborations and thinking about who are the stakeholders that are involved and who, um, who are the stakeholders for global mental health? And maybe being a little bit more broad and inclusive with how we think about that could perhaps shape by addressing some of these other issues that don't necessarily fall within what we narrowly sometimes define as mental health, but are very much related to people's experiences and people's well being. And I think one of the opportunities and the exciting thing for me as a new faculty coming to Mailman is being at a place where. All of us, we're sitting across three different departments at a school of public health, all with different strengths, all with different areas of focus. And I think that is a starting point, perhaps not everything, right? Because there are so many stakeholders beyond the walls of a school of public health that should be included in these and programs and areas of research and things like that. But I think it's very exciting that we can come together from these different disciplines um, to hopefully craft and think about research priorities in that way. One of the things I wanted to highlight that has been announced a few times is a, a new project that um, was funded by the Centennial Grand Challenges Award uh, through the Dean's Office here at Mailman. And as I think Dean Freed mentioned, one of the things we're aiming to do with this study that I think most of us that you've heard from are somehow involved in has been to see, can we try to integrate traditional mental health and psychosocial programming with economic supports and services? Um, this really comes from findings across all of our areas of research, where I think in different settings, different populations, we keep hearing from these communities we're working with on mental health projects, that there's a real need to address poverty and economic instability and food insecurity. And all of these things are really central to people's experience of wellness and well-being. So the goal of this project, um, which is being conducted in Ecuador in partnership with uh, Refugee Protection and Health Organization, HIAS, and I'm Pleased to acknowledge my colleagues from HIAS here, Camilo and Diani, who are uh, the country director and mental health officer for HIAS Colombia. So we're working in partnership with an NGO that is really dedicated to providing 
protection and economic support and mental health support to displaced populations in Latin America and really globally. And trying to work, again, talking about partnership and collaboration with practitioners, with people who have kind of the local expertise, with communities, with researchers, to figure out how can we more holistically address the mental health and psychosocial needs of this, of this population in particular. So stay tuned, we're just starting with this project, but really looking forward to over the next few years, seeing how we can more holistically address some of these determinants of mental health in our approach as well. And I know, I, Dr. Bob, I think you need to leave a little early. So I wonder if you want to jump in and uh, connect us a little bit to the city. Uh, yeah, <clears throat> very good, glad to do it. Uh, I think I was supposed to be doing what I was going to do at 11.30. So <laughs> not to worry, I'm here for a while, very quickly. Um, I think the way to imagine my own take in this is well represented by the fact that I'm here instead of at Eastern New York State Correctional Facility, where I teach a class, Introduction to Public Health, as part of a Bard Prison Initiative. Figure this out with me. What's the likelihood that after a decade in a state prison, a maximum security state prison, you get out, are put back in the community, and instantly you go back to the way you functioned before you went in? What's the likelihood of that? Well, the answer is almost zero. But that is exactly where the system of mass incarceration operates in the United States. There is an assumption that once you are home, you are free, so everything goes back to normal. But every single person I know who spent time in prison and who has had to struggle with their readjustment back in the community will tell you it is difficult. There is such a thing as post-incarceration stress disorder, which they often experience in a wide variety of ways, never wanting to be in a room with a locked door always having to keep a window open, always looking behind you, wondering whether or not there isn't some threat that you should be paying attention to. In a rational society, our system of parole and our system of pre-release counseling would have a great deal of concern for the mental functioning of folk who are about to go back home. We would be very concerned with their ability to integrate into the society that they left. We'd be hugely aware of the fact that some 75% of all persons who are released from a state prison will go back in seven years. And we would be very clear that if we help people with their adjustment, maybe they'd stay. Thus reducing the costs that as a nation we pay as a result of mass incarceration. So what's been the way in which I've seen responses really work in this kind of challenge? Agency. I talk about this a lot in class. The Bard Prison Initiative is not just giving people a college degree. It's not even just exposing them to education. What people will tell you in the midst of a classroom is the moment when you start to look at yourself based on the knowledge of the world that you've acquired through an education. And all of a sudden, something as complicated, but as absolutely essential as redemption becomes possible. You're able to look at your past. You're able to put it in perspective. You understand yourself. You may be clear about the adverse childhood experiences, which are so much a part of the history of folk who are incarcerated. And understanding that you have potentially the tools to work this through, the step towards normal functioning, whatever that means, becomes that much more possible. I'm very much impressed with what we do, not as services that we render for someone else, but what we do as organizers, as educators, to help people deal with their own realities and come up with the strength, as well as the resources to do something about them. It's an essential part of what I'm hoping we're gonna to continue to promote in the certificate that we've established here, because it seems to me with large numbers of folk from the Bard Prison Initiative who are here as students, we not only have an opportunity to sort of interact with folk who've been there and done that, their effort to change what's going on, what impacted their lives so drastically becomes part of our struggle as well. And I have to add this, one looks at me and assumes that, oh, I know who you are. You must be the guy who does all of the programs for minorities. I think folk ignore the fact that uh, I also function internationally. Comme vous savez bien, mes chers amis, je parle français. Je fais partie d'un projet en France qui s'appelle le bateau pédagogie. In France, in the city of Nantes, there are a group of folk from Martinique who put together something called the teaching ship. It represents an effort on their part because they are folk of color, largely, who are able to trace their roots in Africa, trying to understand why history 
especially the history of slavery, is not taught at all in French public schools. The idea that you can build a replica of a slave ship, use that as an educational device to help folks understand that part of that history, but also help folk who are folk of color understand how it is that they're in France doing the things that they do, where connection to your history and understand how much that history produced your every day is also a step towards something that looks like improved mental health. I think the idea that, you know, there's both a national and an international element to this and being in a position to sort of bridge the two has certainly been, at least for me, as someone who just celebrated his 40th anniversary working with Mindy Thompson, Fully Love, the leading social psychiatrist, I think, in the United States looking at some of these issues, uh, thinking about this with all of you and with her, and the idea that the school is committing itself to do something significant about this, I think, is a, an idea whose time has come. Thank you. Thank you. And I think also that was a really great uh, descriptive example of kind of context and mental health and mental health and context and how they all kind of loop together. And I wonder, Ale, if you want to talk a little bit about physical health and mental health and how they act. Sure. Um, thank you. Yeah. So another area that um, I think is really interesting and also really important to start focusing on is the interrelationship between mental health issues and what's usually referred to as physical health issues, right? And so I came to mental health really, really similar to Dr. Lovero from uh, being a primary care physician and really working around uh, physical uh, health areas such as non-communicable diseases, specifically diabetes and hypertension. And when I was providing clinical uh, care in rural areas in Guatemala, and later working as a researcher, I learned that uh, a lot of the people who are living with diabetes and hypertension are really going through different, um, really existential crises, uh, dealing with their new identities of having been diagnosed with a new disease and trying to uh, cope with a new disease with the very limited resources that are found in these areas. And so uh, when I, I was really interested in the physical, the biomedical area of this, but I learned that the emotional part, the psychological part of, of struggling with these diseases was really important. And that's how I came to, to global mental health, really. And so there's also this literature in syndemics, which, is, which really refers to the synergies between different types of health problems. And so, for example, uh, there has been uh, some papers published in The Lancet recently looking at the syndemic between diabetes, depression, and poverty in low and middle income countries. So that's an example of a pandemic. And I think it's an important framework or a useful framework that we could use not only to do research, but also to start to think about how we can start to tackle some of these problems in a more integrated way, rather than looking at only mental health issues or only chronic uh, or physical health issues. And that's, I think, something that we should start to work a little bit more on, and it's an area that I want to explore uh, later in my research and public health work. And now I think, Jeremy, I'm sorry we've been ignoring you up there on the, the screen. <laughs> um, I know you were going to talk a little bit about kind of some of these developments and so also some of the perhaps shortfalls and opportunities in the field of yeah. global mental health. Maybe I'll kick it to you. Thanks, Claire. And thanks um, to my four colleagues there on the stage um, for such great comments. Uh, sorry for not being with you there in person. Thanks for accommodating me uh, today. Um, so yes, yeah, so I totally agree with what's been said. I think that what we think of as, as you know, quote, global mental health is a lot different than what it was thought of, you know, 20 years ago or 10 years ago, or even five years ago. You know, the field is expanding, I think, pretty rapidly. Um, and appropriately, and it needs new expertise from lots of different fields. And I think engaging people in those fields is actually a huge goal of this sort of new GMH at Mailman group. So we look forward to interacting with many of you in the weeks and months and years to come. Um, but with my sort of my time, I wanted to transition a bit um, to circle back to Ezra's comments about decolonization and global health. And, you know, sort of to reinforce what he said, I think that as important as everything that we've talked about so far is, right, as important as it is to talk about, you know, what the field should focus on, what the scientific question should be, um, it's equally, if not more so important to focus on the who will be doing this work, 
and how this work will be done, right? Um, and these are questions we get a lot from, from students who are interested in coming into global mental health. Um, and of course, this is a big conversation that needs to have a whole you know, seminar or event by itself, which we actually hope to do in the coming months through GMH at Mailman. Um, but I think important for us to touch on it here at our kickoff event, right? So when we think about um, how global health should be conducted, as opposed to how it is being conducted, um, a really nice uh, starting point um, that I like pe to refer people to is a series of papers in the Lancet. Um, and so there's a series of essays that were published in Lancet that is focused on ethical issues in global health. So if you just Google global health ethics Lancet, you'll find them. And the series of papers raises uh, a lot of really sticky issues. I really encourage everyone out there to read all of the papers in that series. I think there's about 20 of them at this point. Um, but I'll just mention sort of two topics that have been front and center in my own mind. Um, the first of which um, Ezra did talk about it a little bit, which is funding. And so, you know, where does funding for global mental health research go? Uh, the majority usually goes to big research institutions in high income countries with a much smaller piece going to the actual implementing organization or university in the country where the work is actually being done, right? Usually in the global south. And, you know, we have to acknowledge that there is a financial incentive uh, for research institutions in high income countries to keep that system in place and for funders to operate that way. And, um, you know, what this can often mean, I think, unfortunately, and to the detriment of all people involved, is that the research agenda for global mental health is driven by high income country researchers like us, right? Uh, and high income country institution, institutions and funders. And so I think that's problematic, right? Um, and then second, I wanted to mention publishing. So, you know, oftentimes in global health work, uh, study team members from the implementing in-country team are underrepresented in, in published papers. Um, even when they are represented, oftentimes the, the places of prominence in an authorship list go to, to us, right, the high income country investigators. And that's partly a function of us um, getting the funding in the first place, right? We apply for a grant, we're PIs on a grant, and there are expectations that the papers resulting from that grant have the PIs as first and or, you know, senior author, which enables us to be more, to be more competitive for future grant applications, uh, it in turn reduces the ability and the competitiveness of LMIC investigators to be as competitive. And you can see how this could turn into sort of a vicious cycle, right? Um, and so, and I mean, we have to also admit, right, that we are as faculty incentivized and pressured to have these those authorship spots so that we can get promoted and that we can get tenure. Uh, these are important conversations for us to have, right? So how is it that people who are um, coming into the field, right? So, you know, students in the audience, um, Ally, who's starting her career in global mental health, Claire and Kate and I as junior faculty, early investigators, how do we move forward in the field and uh, participate in these research projects ethically, right? I think um, as a starting point, it's important for us to acknowledge that as individual researchers, we are contributing to this problem, right? You know, all the two things I just mentioned, getting research grants where the majority is, is remains in the US, um, having unbalanced authorship lists. I've been a part of both of those things, right? So we individually have to acknowledge that, that we are part of that problem, but then also the, the wealthy research institutions in the US and other high income countries um, also need to acknowledge their role in order, in order for, um, for the field to truly make Make a change, um, and so you know I don't want to be too much of a, a downer. The field has really has really done a lot of amazing work, um, and you know we I bring this up not because we have answers for it, but because the questions I think are so important, and so we need to be thinking about them and talking about them again and again. Every time we talk about a research question that we want to answer, we also have to talk about um, you know how are we going to go about answering that research question in the right way, in a way that is. Uh, that is equitable, right? Um, it's it's Health Equity Week, right? That was mentioned. And I think, unfortunately, most of us would agree right now that global mental health as it currently exists is not really an equitable field. Um, and I think it's incumbent upon us who are starting um, starting out in the field as, as early investigators and students 
to um, to do what we can to to make it more equitable. So um, so so I'll stop there. But I'd love to hear you know from the audience and 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 folks who are in the room there about their thoughts on this. Thanks. Thanks, Jeremy. Anyone from the panel want to chime in, or should we turn it to all of you for comments, reflections, questions? Jeremy's conundrum, because that would be a good starting point. I actually would just add another question, which is I think the idea of health equity when it comes to mental health is a pretty poor goal, just considering the highest achieving areas, as Kathy mentioned, still do pretty poorly. So um, I think in one addition to that too is conceptualizing where we think we're going and it not necessarily being how things are in the high income countries of the most funded areas. Things like that. I'd like to raise a question. I don't know if you can hear me. We can hear you, Mirna. Hello. Hello. I, I was very interested in, and touched by Jeremy's uh, talk. And I would like to know specifically what kinds of solutions he would uh, propose that might help some of these problems he has defined so clearly. Well, I can talk about it from at a systems level, it's a bit harder, but from an individual researcher perspective, there are certainly certain things that we can do to improve, for example, publishing. Um, so uh, as one current example, so Claire and I are currently leading, co-leading a study in, um, in Northern Zambia with um, several different Zambian organizations, as well as the Zambian uh, government. And we are about to, to publish a new, uh, a new paper based on some of that work. And we have basically, um, instituted a policy um, for that study that the papers that come out will have um, shared uh, co-first authorship and share co-senior authorship between a U.S. and one of our investigators here and then one of the investigators um, in Zambia. So we'll have two first authors and two senior authors on our papers. And that sounds kind of, you know, to some people it maybe sounds sort of silly. But I think it's, this was actually, I shouldn't take credit for this. This was actually um, a uh, proposed solution in one of those Lancet papers that I had, I had mentioned. And there are gonna be some journals that we might submit the paper to that would scoff at it. And I think, and Claire can weigh in too. I, uh, I think what we're planning to say to those journals is then we'll go somewhere else. You know, I think it's that important to us that we have this sort of shared um, ownership of the project um, and that there is equity in publishing with our colleagues who are really, to be honest, doing all of the work for the studies in Zambia that, um, that we need to make that a priority. And so that's how we're approaching it with that project. That's how I am, I am beginning to, to approach all the papers I work on in my projects. And, you know, it's a small thing, um, but it's, um, it's hopefully a step in the right direction. So that's, that's sort of one for publishing runner. The other would be would be funding. And um, there has been, you have seen a little bit of movement from like NIH in this regard. So some of their more recent grants through um, the, the Center for Global Mental Health at NIMH, they are now um, mandating that the prime award for the grant goes to the institution in the country where the work is being done. Um, whereas that never, at least and maybe Ezra knows uh, better, I don't think that used to be the case very often from NIH. So that is a new sort of a new change in the past five years that they have made. But still, I mean, the vast, vast majority of NIH funding comes to, to universities here. Um, and so part of, you know, again, thinking about ownership of this from an individual perspective for us could be, you know, should we start seeking out um, grant funders who, um, who are uh, excited about and willing to provide the majority of funding to um, to the in-country team and the university and institution that's working there. Um, yeah, but I don't, I mean, these are, <laughs> I don't have, I don't have big answers right now, but, so, but that is, I mean, this is, I think one of the biggest questions facing us currently, for sure. Just to add to me. I'm gonna jump in a second, Jeremy. I wanna be sure, are there people in the room that have questions? You've been um, quiet so far, but I know we wanted to give an opportunity. Does anybody have comments or questions? Or Sorry, Ezra, I just, I know that there was, some movement before, um, yeah, uh, Amelia is going to the back. Um, yeah. 
Is it working? Oh, okay. So I know that through like a Western biomedical lens, at least like one of the primary treatments for mental health conditions is like psychotherapy or talk therapy. But I also recognize that in a lot of places, both like in the US and abroad, there's a lack of trained like therapists or counselors. And in addition, in a lot of places, there is a cultural stigma against, you know, telling a complete stranger about like your personal and emotional problems. So I'm wondering if any of those obstacles are things that any of you have faced in your work and like what alternative treatment solutions there are when you face those kinds of obstacles. Thank you, thank you for that question. So that's definitely um, a challenge. And I think it's definitely something that a lot of the times if we come only from a biomedical perspective, and we try to impose these Western views of mental health can be really something that doesn't really have a, an impact in the populations that we're trying to serve. And that's definitely something that I've uh, seen uh, when working in rural areas with in indigenous populations in Guatemala. So I have to acknowledge that I don't identify as indigenous and I was trained as a primary care physician. So in my first experiences, I was trying to approach the field from the biomedical and Western perspective. And uh, when I started really conducting some qualitative work and you know, just um, with, through clinical experiences, I started to learn that most people in the community don't really see mental health as we see it. And um, so I think that's, that's something that we really need to, to um, to understand, to first acknowledge that. And also the only way that we can start to think about some ways to address some of the mental health issues in, in some of these communities and really everywhere, not only, in, it doesn't really have to be indigenous communities in a lower middle income country, it can really be here around New York. And uh, something that we really need to do is to start partnering with some people in the community. And I don't mean just partnering during the research uh, experience. It's, it's really building relationships with them and uh, learning from their perspectives what they see as mental health issues. And so just one particular example, there's I conducted some qualitative research in Guatemala and I learned that for most people, mental health is really not seen as uh, a disease, as a biomedical disease. Sorry about that. So it's it's really something that arises from different life circumstances, right? So poverty, exposure to violence, exposure to civil war, et cetera. So that's just something that we really need to start understanding if we really want to start building programs or interventions that really respond to those needs. That's just one example. And I know Claire has many examples too. <laughs> That was said beautifully, Ale. I just one thing that that reminded me of, and I think is also ties to some of Jeremy's points earlier around the kind of systems that reinforce us to do things in a certain way. We had a, a project also actually with Hyas in Ecuador and Panama. And as a, our plan is we selected, I'm sorry, there's a horrible, um, I'll hold this a little further away. Maybe that'll help. Um, so our plan was we had, when we designed this study and we applied for funding, we had an intervention in mind that we thought in consultation with our partners in Ecuador and Panama might fit the needs of the, these communities. And we did some initial qualitative work where we asked them kind of what are the priorities? What are the problems that are most important in your community? And they were all things like Ale said, kind of economic insecurity, um, safety and, and issues related to violence. And we realized very quickly that the intervention we selected was not a good fit at all. It was much more biomedical and also very individual. And the desire here was to have more of a collective kind of uh, social type of intervention. And so we went back to the funder and they were really not happy about this, but we said, wait, we're gonna need like six more months to really figure out what to do that meets the needs of the community as they describe them to us. And what was a really new experience for me, but also I think really gratifying is we, kind of said, all right, let's start from the ground up and let's co-design an intervention with communities, pulling in some interventions that we know or components that we know might work, but present them to communities and say, does this fit your needs? How, do, how should we modify it? What are some things, some 
customs or, or local practices that could also promote well being and psychosocial uh, and mental health. And together, kind of co develop this intervention with community partners, with uh, NGO partners, with academic partners. And I think one of the reasons I brought this up is because it also, like I mentioned, our donor was not happy about this because they have a time schedule. They wanted us to kind of deliver on the things we originally promised, but there is this tension between kind of understanding how to navigate that, how to actually meet community needs, especially when you're outside of that community and really pushing back on some of those systems that try to kind of do things in a way that is not really serving the broader goals of health equity, of global mental health, et cetera. I'm really curious because Alejandra, right? You mentioned something that it's happening also in, in the rest of Latin America, and even when we're talking when we're talking about refugees and migrants, it's about the in terms of priorities, right? When we start to work with refugees, with ones who want to stay in the country and the others who want in transit, they are not realizing in terms of what are the real priorities for them. I mean, and and that's one of the topics we will discuss this afternoon. It's about it's not the same. I mean, for them, mental health is not part of their priorities. They want to just do food, shelter, and some kind of health, physical services, because they have been moving from Venezuela to Colombia in this case. For example, they keep moving south and now moving north. You know what is happening actually here. So I'm, I'm, I'm really, it's, it's interesting to know that because actually the main focus we're working with them and trying to just to show the importance about mental health but the point is they're reaching us looking for other type of services. We start to provide mental health services. And after a couple of months or maybe a couple of sessions, they said, okay, this is something that I really need, but I didn't know that I needed. And that's, that's crucial because sometimes we need to use another type of services. that are more related with saving lives. Could be talking about this. And we are reaching them and we are providing some other type of services that maybe is showing the importance to them about the mental health during the transit and also where we are, they are located in the country. Thank you, thank you for that comment. Yeah, I think we have a lot of things in common in the Latin American region and we have a lot of opportunities to learn from each other, working with different populations in need. Um, I just wanted to add that that, that I think is key, right, really to start raising awareness and trying to educate some populations that might not be aware of mental health, but also trying to respond to their needs, right? And that's something that uh, we're trying to do with uh, the project that Dr. Sasser mentioned earlier, which is going to be a recovery oriented, it is going to try to build a recovery oriented model of mental health services for people living with uh, severe mental illnesses in rural Guatemala. And so we're gonna start really to try to understand what are the outcomes that really matter for people living with these illnesses and also their communities and their family, their relatives who play a really important role in their care. And we're gonna start from there. And this is a really different approach uh, to what's usually done, right? Usually we start with an intervention that was evaluated in a high income country and we try to adapt it somehow to the context rather than you know, starting with the context and what's important and then trying to find something that helps with, that, uh, with those needs. So that's something that we're gonna do and I would love to learn also from your experiences and what we've been doing. But thank you for that comment. Thank you. Hi, I just wanted to thank you guys so much for your thoughts and comments. Um, my name is Shriya, I'm a second year EPI student here at Millman. Um, I think mine is also more of a comment than a question, but when we were talking earlier about decolonizing mental health, I think we were talking a lot about who is conducting these studies, like who are our researchers. Um, and I think we should also be thinking about who is participating in these studies. And I think it's important to diversify our study samples because we know that most of the data we collect and all of our statistics are from populations in high income countries. And I think it's important to have representative data moving forward if we wanna achieve health equity. Also a very good point. I wonder Ezra and Jeremy, if you'd wanna comment on those, on that comment. Um, well, I, I have two comments. 
Um, one is, I completely agree about the diversity of samples. And um, this is something that um, some efforts were made back in the 60s and 70s, but the, um, it's been largely disregarded, um, except for in terms of surveys of common mental disorders, which, you know, questionable cultural validity, but um, the, there's an effort now starting again to gather more in-depth information from the rest of the globe, you know, most of the globe. And, and that's still a, a real weakness and really important. The other thing, um, I forgot the first part of the question, but I think it had to do with um, uh, decoloniality. Am I right? The, yep. Well, anyway, it came up elsewhere. But, I, you know, we, we have the opportunity now, which we didn't ever have before, to... Um, for the grants to go to low and middle income countries and for people there to lead the grants and for people here to be, you know, MPIs, which is like still um, counts on your CV. So that, that didn't exist before. But um, to do this, um, it's really difficult because people don't know how to write grants for the US and so forth. But or how to handle the administrative procedures of NIH, but, but they can learn. And, um, and um, I only do those kind of grants now. And um, it does require, um, you just have to um, work with people um, on this learning curve of you know, how they can take control of these, um, of these things. I think that, that that's essential. And you know, that, that's what the Karims did in South Africa. They basically took all the thing and made it like a world-renowned program of their own. And that's like, I think that's where we have to go. It's hard. Okay. And, 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 yeah. So okay. go ahead, Adam, wanna wrap up? Uh, no, no, let um, Jeremy. Jeremy, you want to comment? No, I can't follow Ezra. Ezra gets the last word, and it was a really great one that I agree with <laughs> everything he said. So I think we're in a good spot, Kathy. Thanks. Okay, very good. Well, then I'll wrap up for the room, which is first to thank everyone. I, I mean, I am struck by the range of questions that came and other thoughts that run through my mind. For example, um, we can this this um, how we do collaborations more equitably is true anytime you're in a community. <laughs> we don't do that well in the United States either. <laughs> and I just wanna say that it's I, the movement of decolonization has helped us to think about that. But I think for those of us who've worked in communities for a very long time in the States that maybe we didn't do so well here either and that we should take those same lessons. Um, thought, Bob, I thought maybe you were gonna chime in on that comment. <laughs> Um, so uh, I would I would add that as a thinking local and global, and that um, that I it's I, I think that it's a, a fascinating growth of the field, which is one that started on focusing on treatment and access and the gap and the disparities, and that we are com committed to continue to, uh, to be committed to that. However, when we're listening to our colleagues from other countries, as is the case here, that we, we see the great impact of all of these social and economic determinants that we sort of are thinking from the public health perspective. And so that's, I think, what we, I, I personally want to leave as a challenge to us, that we have lots of ways we can enhance our, our work. Um, and if we are driven by the context, as Ali said, we will note all of those things and then challenge ourselves to figure out how we, we move in that line as well as we expand what global mental health and population mental health is. So did I hit the key points and are you ready for lunch? <laughs> Thank you really everyone very much. And those of you on the Zoom. Um, so we've launched, I guess we've launched and um, <laughs> Um, and I will say that the lot, you're probably thinking there's no lunch on the tables, what's going on, but the lunch is in the, um, for those of you that don't know, most faculty don't know, there's a little faculty lounge across the way, and that's, at, that's where the food actually is. So feel free to go in there, either pick up your lunch, take it with you, please come back, we can stay in here for a little while longer for networking, we'd love if you did that. So thank you, everyone.